Hey there, so glad you could join me again and if you're new to the show, thanks for welcoming me into your home. Today we're going to be looking at a photography technique called painting with light. So feel free to follow along at home or just curl up in your rocking chair and get comfortable as we paint some happy little photos. So, light painting. What is it exactly? Well, it's a photography technique where you use a small focused light source, usually a flashlight like this, or but it could be anything that gives off light really, to gradually build up light in certain parts of your image to create a certain effect. Think of it kind of the same way that a painter would create a painting. You've got your empty canvas and you use a brush with paint on it to gradually build up the paint in different amounts of color, different amounts of density in various areas of the canvas to build up the image. Painting with light in photography is pretty much the same idea. You've got your blank canvas, which is usually a near black or completely black scene, and you use a small light source to gradually add light exactly where you want it. It's got a lot of uses for artistic purposes. It can create a kind of a painterly effect. Uh, it can also simulate a very large light source, as we'll see soon, because basically you're moving your light around. So over the course of the long exposure, this is always done using longer exposures, it has the same effect as if your light source were larger. It allows you to fill in shadows in certain areas so you get softer shadows than what you would get normally. Uh, now usually we do this in pitch black, so we've got to turn the lights off. Okay, maybe we'll leave the lights on for the parts where I talk and then turn it off when we shoot. So it's easier for you to see my mug. Both my mugs, this one and this one. So if we have a light shining this way, very small one like this, very close, what's going to happen? We're going to get very harsh highlights up here, very harsh look in the, in the skull, strong shadows, behind it's going to have a very strong shadow. Let's uh, turn the light off for a second, take a shot and see what it looks like, shall we? We've got our camera set with a 24 to 105 millimeter lens, which I believe is set to around 50 millimeters or so. For now, we're going to shoot at ISO 100 with a two second exposure at F8. with a two second delay, so it's a bit easier for us to get set. All right, what does this look like exactly? It looks kind of like what we thought it would. We've got a very harsh highlights, very specular highlight on the top of the stainless steel over here. Uh, very harsh, kind of creepy looking light over here, strong shadows, got a big strong shadow coming behind the goblet with a very sharp edge on it which is standard for a small light source like this. Now, what if we were to, over the course of these two seconds, move the light around? We would end up with what looks to be a softer light. So let's try this now. So we're just gonna go in a side to side motion here. So you can see there's a big difference in this one. The skull is much more well lit around the sides. That harsh highlight we had up here is now really nice, soft, and even. You can actually see the texture of the stainless steel. The big shadow behind here is all but gone, and it's certainly a lot softer than it was. So how did this work exactly? Think of this flashlight for a moment as a can of spray paint. If I have it over here and I give a spritz, what's gonna happen? It's gonna cover this whole side in paint, It'll cover a little bit around the edges, trailing off as we get to the side, and then nothing behind here, no paint over here. Essentially, think of it as a big shadow. Then, if I bring the can over to this side, give another spritz, we'll be filling in paint on this side. We'll essentially be filling in the shadow as well on the ground. We won't have any paint covering back here, but that's okay because we already have it still covered from before when we spritzed on the other side. When we move the flashlight around while painting with light, it's the same thing. When the flashlight's over here, it's filling in this side, and then as it moves over here, it starts to fill in the other side. Because it's a long exposure, it's essentially the same as if we had one big light wrapping around. It's a lot softer, you get much better shadows, and you can fill in details a bit more. Now, what do you think were to happen if we were to actually move the light all the way around? Because depending on how you position the light, depending how quickly you move it, you can get a completely different look every time. So let's try that. 
Now well, with the two second delay, so it's a bit easier for us to get set. So that was one pass around. And you can see again, compared to the previous one, different look, that uh, stainless steel up here, even softer. The, sp the highlight is spread out a lot more. The lighting looks a lot more even as it wraps around the side as well. And uh, that was with the goblet, that was with the flashlight out to the side. So we're going to do one more. Let's see what happens if we put it just up the top here. Yeah, definitely different. So it's what you'd expect if you had a light directly on top, really. You're getting just the edges of everything highlighted. You got very dark uh, shadows over here, down here, basically everywhere the light didn't cover. We could even try one going all the way around, wrapping around it. So what we're going to do is we'll set it to a four second exposure. So we got a bit more time to play with this. There's four seconds. There it is. What's around there? What's around the top? Maybe a bit of backlighting. Let's see what this looks like, shall we? Yeah, again, totally different. It looks like, almost kind of like it was in, not quite a tent lighting, but we do have lighting almost everywhere but down here. Now, that streak that we're seeing over here, that's the flashlight that was in the shot. You can even have your light source in the shot if you want to get some interesting effects like that. To do something like that, you can use pretty much any kind of light source that you move around. As I said, you can use a flashlight for this, uh, but you could also use one of those fiber optic lamps. You could use a jar full of fireflies. You could use a bioluminescent jellyfish, anything really. One thing I found recently that's pretty interesting and looks great depending on how you use it, is this. This is what we call electroluminescent wiring. It's basically a wire that lights up, plugged into, plugged into a little controller like this. Press the button, and it lights up when there are batteries in it. So, and thanks to the magic of editing, we now instantaneously have batteries. Press the button, there we go, light. So, what do you think is going to happen if we start waving this around in the scene? Let's find out. Now, I am going to change the ISO for this because I know from experience these things are nowhere near as bright as the flashlight, so they need a little more sensitivity for the shot. So let's go to four hundred. Let me toy these around a little over here, something like that, maybe just in the front like that. That's crazy. Where's my light? There it is. So, because this, these wires were moving around the whole time, they blurred. Kind of like when you have a longer shutter speed or you've got somebody running, what happens? They're not sharp, right? They're completely blurred. That's what happened here. And the skull is not very well lit, which is okay, because we weren't actually lighting it up with this. We can combine these two light sources. We can use the wires and the flashlight. The problem with that is if you want to do it one shot, which can be done, you either have to have a very long exposure, so you have enough time to do your thing with the flashlight, put it down, pick up the wires and do that, or you need to do both at the same time, which is not that easy because it requires a lot of coordination. So we're going to do something different. We're going to hop into Photoshop. I'm going to take this shot and I'm going to merge it with the lit up skull goblet from one of the earlier shots. And I'm going to show you a very quick, very accurate way to do this. Okay, we're in Photoshop now. We've got three images here to look at. Now obviously we're going to be using this one as our main image for the fancy blue and green lighting we've got. We've got a choice between these two photos for what we're going to use for the lighting on the goblet itself. Now because this technique is going to be pretty quick, we could actually use both very quickly and we can decide later which one we want to use or we could use bits and pieces of each. 
So the first thing we have to do is stack them into one image with three different layers. So easiest way to do that is to hit V on the keyboard or select the move tool over here. Pick our first image. We'll hold the shift key and drag it over right like that. Because we held shift, it then lines it up perfectly because these were shot on the tripod. They have the exact same resolution and everything. They should line up perfectly. We'll close this. Now a quick way to tell if they're lined up with pixel accuracy, we'll hit control zero and then control alt zero to zoom into 100%. And we'll just make the opacity of this layer 50%. Now if we don't see any kind of ghosting or overlap, they're lined up perfectly. If it was misaligned, you could go first off select both layers or however many layers you're, you're stacking. In our case it'll be three in a moment. You could go to edit, auto line layers, click auto, click OK, and Photoshop would line them up for you as closely to pixel perfect accuracy as, you can, as it can. Because these are already aligned because they were on a tripod and we weren't touching the camera even to trigger it, we're fine. Cancel. Grab the other image, hold shift, drag it over, drop it. There we go. Close that. I said close that. No. There we go. So we'll just work with one layer for the moment, two layers that is. We'll turn off this middle layer. Now we want to take the lighting from this goblet here and merge it with the fancy blue lighting from the background. So the simple way to do that, of course, is we can just mask. So we'll hold Alt on the keyboard and click the mask option here. Because we held Alt, it's going to give us a black mask instead of a white one. So we can see everything here is masked out on this layer. Let's go ahead and name our layers while we're at it. Top layer will be Goblet 2. Middle layer will be Goblet 1. And the background layer will be Fancy Lights. So, Goblet 2 layer. Goblet 1 is turned off at the moment. We've got a black mask on there. So we're going to push B on the keyboard for the brush tool, which is right over here. Make sure we've got the mask selected. We want to be painting with white. If it's not white, you can press X to spin the colors around. If you don't have white in either of these two options, you can simply press D, and that will reset them to black and white. We've got opacity at 20%. Our brush hardness is at zero, because we want a nice soft effect here. We don't want any harsh edges. And we can just start to gradually paint in the skull. Get the build up the light we want, get a little over there. Something like that. We want a little bit down here too. Now that works fine while we're just over the goblet. But once we start getting to the edge, we have a problem. You can see we're going to start to paint out the lights. We want the base down here, we're painting that out too. It doesn't work so well. So there are a couple of ways around this. First, you could take the pen tool and very carefully draw a selection around the goblet, which will work, but it's very time-consuming and it starts to get a little difficult when you get around here. But there's another option. What we can do is we can tell Photoshop to only show us the parts of this gob Goblet 2 layer that are brighter than what's underneath it. So let's dump the mask for a moment. Select it, hit delete. Now let's look at this Goblet. These parts over here, nice and bright. These parts over here, pretty dark. So when we show, tell Photoshop to, tell, to only show us the areas of this goblet layer that are brighter than what's underneath, what do you think is going to happen? Because this part down here, which is on the fancy lights layer on the background, is brighter clearly than the pure black background we had. So let's try it and see. We're going to change the blending mode here. By default it's on normal. We want to go to lighten. We're telling Photoshop, only show me the parts of this layer that are brighter than what's beneath it. Poof. How's that for crazy? There's a pretty much perfect job of blending everything together, especially down here. Very carefully blend it in. Only the parts from the Goblet 2 layer that were brighter than what's underneath. Now we can go a step further if we want. We can put a mask on here if we want. Press X to switch our colors around from the brush tool. And maybe we think it's a bit too strong on the base. Maybe we can just paint in a bit there to darken it a bit. Maybe we don't want too much of the, uh, the wood table either, so we can just slowly darken some of that by painting it out 
What we're doing is we're painting black onto the mask that we placed. We could even paint out a little bit of the back over here to give a bit more of a sculpted look. Eh, sculpted. I made it funny. There we go. What do we think? Looks pretty good. Let's zoom into 100% to really pixel peep this thing. And it looks like it was shot with one image, not two. Now we had two layers here, remember? So let's just turn this off, turn this on for a moment. Let's do the same thing here and see what we get. Normal to lighten. Again, very good selection, except we have this streak from where the flashlight went behind. So what we'll do is we'll place a mask here. We still got our black color selected and we can slowly paint that out. I'm going to hit zero to go to 100% just to quickly get that out of the way. Not crazy about this, but you might like it. Do that, that there. Do that. Now let's go to 20% and slowly tone this highlight down. More accurately get rid of that one. There you go. A little, more, a little bit more work than the uh, previous layer, but not too bad. So let's just see what happens if we turn this top layer on. So now what it's doing is it's showing us the parts from the Goblet 2 layer that are lighter than everything underneath. Then what's left from the Goblet 1 layer that's brighter than the Goblet 2 is showing us that. So there we go, we got that. Now we can go to the Goblet 2 layer and do the same thing, Goblet 1 layer, sorry, the middle one. And we can also paint out the bottom here. In fact, if we preferred what we had from the other layer, let's just go to zero on the keyboard. Completely eliminate this from the Goblet 2, the Goblet 1 layer. So the table on the bottom here, doing nothing from this layer. We're only getting it from our top layer. And again, if we want to maintain that sculpted, harder shadow on the side here, Goblet 1 layer, which is the middle, two on the keyboard for 20% opacity for the brush and we just start same thing as before we paint that down and there we go I'm gonna do a little bit more to get rid of some of this weirdness that's going around on the sides here this is from our goblet yeah goblet one layer zero on the keyboard and we'll just wipe that out completely which is okay because we have it on the other layer as well the detail from there and there we go so with a few short uh, commands including the blending mode we went from that to that not too shabby so now we just want to bump this up a little bit more obviously it needs a bit of contrast because everything does the easiest way to do it is to just go to the contrast slider but that's also the worst tool in Photoshop for contrast you can use the S curve method you can use the layers method le levels method one method I like is actually to do two separate curves, one for the highlights and one for the shadows using luminosity masks. So you just go to channels, RGB, there's our selection. We're going to add an adjustment layer. We want to curve, bring that to the top. Let's call that highlights. Then we're going to what we've done is we've added a luminosity mask here. So we can hold Alt and click on this to look at the mask. That's the mask that we added for the highlight adjustment layer. It's going to bump up only the highlights without really affecting the midtones, and almost nothing's going to happen in the shadows. We're doing this in two separate layers, so we have much more fine-tuned control over it. We're then going to push J on the keyboard to duplicate this layer. We're going to press Control i to invert the mask. So that's the mask for the shadow layer. And we're just going to name it Shadows. And we can go to our highlight curve, anchor point in the middle, bring it up. Somewhere around here, shadow curve, point in the middle, bring it down. Somewhere around there. And there we go. Done. Let's put these two in a group so we can toggle them on and off quickly. There we go. Not too much, but a nice little subtle bump. And let's see if we can tweak those colors a little bit. Just make them a little more punchy. My favorite tool for this, a lot of people like hue saturation. I'm much more of a fan of selective color. It gives you a lot more control. 
and you can overdo it like crazy and it's not going to make your colors look ridiculous. It'll only make them look a little weird. Just as an example here, if I crank this magenta down to minus 100, the green goes really bright, but it doesn't go ridiculous. Let's just give a quick example here. Let's open up a hue saturation layer. I'll go to the greens and crank that. See all this nonsense that's happening over here? Whereas if I do the selective color, bring down magenta all the way, bring cyan and yellow up all the way, cyan and magenta together make green, of course, and magenta is the opposite of green, so we're bringing out the magenta and essentially bringing up the green by bringing up cyan and yellow. See how much brighter, but still kind of not ridiculous it looks, whereas if we turn that off and bring up the that's doing all kinds of craziness over here. We don't want that. So hue saturation can go away. We're going to stick with selective color. It's still a little crazy. We're just going to bring this down. There we go. Bring the magenta up to minus 50. Bring this down to, let's say, minus, let's say plus 70. 70. There we go. And then let's see, is that in the blue layer or the cyan layer? Let's try the cyan first. Just crank this a bit. Oh yeah, it's definitely in the cyan layer for that bluish color. So that's simple enough. Just bring up the cyans a little bit. And of course we can bring down magenta and yellow, which together make red. See how that's starting to come alive over there? That's a bit much, so we'll bring that there. Let's just see if there's anything in the blues to see what's going on. Yeah, it's a bit there too. We don't want it to be weaker. So we're gonna bring it maybe down a little bit and then we are going to remove yellow. Is that doing anything? Yeah, a little bit. Bring up cyan, that's not doing much. Oh yeah, it's doing stuff in the goblet, but we don't like what it's doing there. It's killing the color, so we'll keep it like that. Yes, we brought things up a little bit, but added a little more color. Uh, let's bring the opacity of this down to 70%, just tone it down a little bit. There we go. We're done. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks again, as always, for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. And if you have any comments, or if you'd like to know where you can buy bioluminescent jellyfish, just put a line in the comments below.